Yes, and I'm the Director of Philanthropy for GW Women in Business, and I'm so excited that you all have come out here today. Um, and we have the, the, we are fortunate enough to listen to Kevin O'Connell today, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction of him and um, his company, and then I'm going to let you take the stage. Okay. So, um, Kevin is a digital um, storyteller, content creator, and entrepreneur, and he has created the uh, VFYN <laughs> Creative and the Niche Movement, which is um, a community of over 3,000 people where he's helping um, people with startups to create their um, social media content and guiding them on how to take on the business world. So, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Kevin. So, give him a warm applause. Thank you. Get them for Agnes and GW Women's in Business. They've put on an excellent conference so far, right? Come on, where, come on, where, where is it? Come on, give it to me. All right. Um, so from my understanding, I'm the only thing keeping you between lunch. So we're going to spend the next 25 minutes with our stomachs grumbling together as well, because I'm hungry too. Um, but before I get into a little bit more context of who I am and, and why I'm here today speaking with you, I'd like to first start out to, to kind of talk about purpose and, and finding your passion because it's such a big buzzword happening and you know being talked about blogged about um, and a lot of content around this and I can only imagine as college students you're probably like how do I find my purpose or passion at 18, 19, 22, 23 years old right so here's what I want to do so what does it mean to find your niche Agnes alluded to uh, one of my organizations so the two things that I do I run a digital storytelling agency that's my full-time job and then my passion project, uh, that's been a passion project of mine since 2013, and has become a grassroots movement, is the Niche Movement. And it's a community of young professionals uh, helping college students and recent grads to really rethink their career search and find uh, a job that they love uh, and really feel like they have a purpose uh, out of college. And I'm going to get into why that means a lot to me. But, so the, the term niche, we can substitute that for passion or purpose. So what does it mean to find your niche? Here's, here's how I describe and how I've defined it over the last couple of years after writing my first book. It's this, it's this weird intersection of thriving. So was there anybody in the audience that might have played a sport or, or, or played a, uh, an instrument in, in high school? Well, keep those hands up. Who would say like, they were actually good at it? <laughs> okay, so you could say maybe you were thriving playing a sport or, or playing an instrument. Uh, but that's what I want you to feel is when you go about your career. Do you feel like you're thriving? And the reason I don't use the word success is because the word success means a lot to a lot of different people. Money flexibility, where you work, how you work, etc. But it's more about feeling that you're thriving and you're doing well and you're doing work that you want to do. The second uh, part of how we define your niche or your purpose is you feel challenged. Uh, one of the stories I'm going to share in a little bit has to do with somebody that wasn't feeling challenged and he actually started to, to explore to find his niche again. Uh, but I'm a big believer in that you could thrive and be in an environment that you love, but if you aren't being challenged by the work or by your boss, uh, you will quickly fall out of love with that job or that uh, you know, position you're working in. So you need to feel a way that you feel challenged. And the third one that I really thought about a couple years ago is this word invincible. See, I grew up very, very shy, and the fact that I'm up here speaking and I speak often, my grandmother is still amazed that like, this shy little boy that grew up in New Jersey speaks to college students and speaks to young professionals. Uh, but the, the minute that I started to find my niche or get closer to it, I felt invincible. Literally, you will do anything, you'll put the blinders on, and you will, whether you are shy like me, you will make that phone call, get up in front of people and speak, or you will work 12 hours a day to do whatever it takes to get something done. And I can only imagine Agnes and the other GW Women's in Business uh, Committee, you guys did whatever it took to get this conference off the ground, right? And so you, this this intersection of thriving, feeling challenged, and feeling invincible, where you, you can kind of say you have found your niche or your purpose, or you feel close that you're getting there. And now it's not perfect. I'm 33 years old. I graduated college 11 years ago. I can tell you that my niche has come and gone, and that's kind of what I want to share with you guys this, uh, this morning. So the first quote that I want to open up with, and I know they mentioned it, but I will be doing a book signing and give you guys, you guys have access to uh, a free book uh, that I wrote, so you guys will get that at lunch, but, uh, and I can talk more about that. But the first quote that I open up with in, in one of the first chapters is this by this girl, Nicole, Nicole uh, Paquant, she was an American University graduate student when she started working with me a couple of years ago when I was publishing the book. And she said this, uh, we were sitting over coffee and she, you know, I asked her, you just graduated, she's doing a lot of different things, and she said, Kev, I wouldn't realize what I know what I like to do if it wasn't for the things that I experienced that I know I hate. So that could be internships and work environments, it could be clubs and organizations 
you join, but you don't know what you want to do unless you start putting yourself out there and crossing off the things that you like or you don't like and the things that you love. So here's what I want to do. My story is, is fairly interesting. I alluded to growing up in New Jersey, but I went to a small uh, private school, Fairleigh Dickinson University. I basically did what you were supposed to do, right? And you're supposed to declare a major and you're supposed to get an internship. I did all those things. Uh, I declared my major as a marketing degree. Uh, I got my first internship as a, being at, working at a pharmaceutical market research company, literally looking at binders this thick of data, and I absolutely hated it, so I felt uninspired by that work. I then did two, 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 and, two, and, uh, two and three more internships, and what wound up happening is the, I graduated in May of 2016, two months later in July, the internship that you know, we're all promised that might lead into a full-time job was very close to turning into a full-time job, except they didn't want to pay me. And my commute was over an hour and a half from North Jersey to South Jersey. And I was doing uninspiring work. So everything I was supposed to do, PR, marketing, market research, this is where I should be, right? But this picture up here is where I really needed to be. This was taken a year after I graduated. Uh, I started Habitat for Humanity chapter. Uh, my senior year of high school because I really wanted to do service learning and give back and I knew that I could grow from that and I can tell you right now that this is one of the many extracurricular activities that I grew from. So in July of that year that I graduated, I called out sick from this internship and I'm admitting this multiple times on camera and I went to New York City with my wife and her yellow lab belly. We stayed in Central Park and we literally looked at my resume and we revamped what everybody told me, Kev, put all the internships and everything that you've done. And then just leave like a little one or two line of like you were involved in the marketing club and Habitat and the programming committee. And I wound up breaking that rule and I wound up flipping that upside down because I wound up, you know, we, we, we raised money, we recruited people, we did training, we did all these things that uh, employers look for. And I flipped my resume and actually put the internships at the bottom. And I wound up applying for any job I could take in student affairs and spent eight years, uh, so up until 2014, working with college students. Hence why I'm here today. Uh, I worked with them in student leadership, service learning, campus recreation. Uh, but the cool thing is that marketing degree always stuck with me. So 2009, 10, 11, uh, when, when Facebook and social media was really popping, I was the go-to person of like, Kev, what do we need to be doing? The video and photo came along and that's why I started FYN Creative. So I was getting closer to finding my niche. Uh, but here's the kind of timeline to, to break it down. And so it's not, you know, those of you that find your niche right out of college, I applaud you. But I challenge you to take these experiences to really use them as stepping stones and, and learning to figure out what it is that you like to do. So again, I started out with a marketing degree and did a lot of different uh, internships. Spent eight years working in higher education, but again, I was in uninspired by my boss at the time. I was frustrated by the work environment and I knew I had to do something different. And the entrepreneur piece always called me. You know, that year I was doing Habitat for Humanity, I said, wow, I would love to run my own company one day because I, I felt invincible at that point. I then started the niche movement because the, the number one thing I started seeing and why, again, why I'm here speaking with you is I saw these student leaders, you know, those were multiple group, you know, those group pictures I showed you just before. I have so many of them filling up my Facebook feed and, and my computer, but I saw hundreds of student leaders like yourself graduate college, do what they were supposed to do, and then basically hit the real world and hate, what, hate life. They hated their boss, they hated the job they took, they went back to graduate school for no reason because other than their advisor or their parents told them to, and they, they felt lost. And I was really frustrated by that at 23, so that's why I started the Niche Movement, which we're now a uh, contributing editor base of 30 plus. We do events uh, all over the Mid-Atlantic, and, uh, and then I started FY and Creative. So I took a leap, my leap of faith was in fall of 2014 when I went into my boss's office literally butterflies in my stomach. I remember it was like September 14th, 2014, and I said, Diane, thank you for your time here, but I'm, going to, I'm leaving to start my own business and I'm moving to DC. And that was a big moment for me to, to start you know, getting closer to finding my niche. But I wanna give you something a little bit more relatable. So this is Nikki Yu. She was uh, somebody that uh, we, we met through the niche movement two or three years ago. She was a typical student leader, like, a lot like yourself, uh, a junior at St. Joe's at the time. And when we started working with her and meeting her, she was, a, was very involved. Uh, so she, as you can see here, she led, uh, she volunteered for the ESL program at, on campus. She then was a soprano for her choir. 
She was also a peer educator helping other uh, students get adapted to St. Joe's. But the thing is, is she had no digital footprint. So if you looked her up, you would, you would basically compare her side, to side, side by side on her resume, just like every other student at St. Joe's. So about three months later, after uh, her listing some of our niche movement content and connecting with some of our editors and some other people in our community, she created an about.me page. And boy, can, can I tell you that this was her first stepping stone because she was terrified of jumping on Twitter and using it. She was afraid to stand out, basically. So she created this page. And you can kind of see here, uh, she has a quote, but she is a psychology and philosophy li linguistics major, but she loved the creative side. But going back to Nicole's uh, quote of how do you know what you uh, love doing if you don't know what you hate doing, she always wanted to experiment with the creative side and didn't know if she should go the psychology ESL route or go the creative route. So fast forward six months later, her senior year, she was sitting in her residence hall watching, uh, I no, she was binge watching Netflix. And she was watching this uh, documentary called uh, Shelter TV, or Shelter Me TV. And it was all about rescue dogs. So who's a dog lover? Because I'm a huge dog lover. Yes, thank you. So so is Nikki. So she's watching Netflix uh, episode after episode and felt really, really inspired by the work that they were not only doing, but the creative side of this documentary. So she took to Twitter after like months of opening up a Twitter account and went through the credits and actually started tweeting and DMing the director of Shelter Me TV. A couple weeks went by, she didn't hear anything. All of a sudden, uh, it was that spring semester of her senior year, the director DM'd her back and said, Nikki, thanks so much for reaching out. I see your, uh, I see your student at St. Joe's. We're actually going to be right across the river in Atlantic City doing a documentary on a police officer and his canine pup. Any shot that you would want to come be a production assistant for the weekend? So it was, and it, she didn't get paid for it, but she got to understand if she liked this. So she, literally, this is Nikki here with uh, the dog, and she, uh, I think it's off camera here, but she's the one kind of holding like the, the lighting screens and things like that. And so she fulfilled that moment, but she still wound up going to Syracuse University to do a master's in ESL, and she's now working full time doing this. So she still dabbles in something other than what she went to school for, but she put herself out there by sending a tweet after watching Netflix and really found a way to stand out outside of just a piece of paper. So that's story number one. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, again, when I was writing this book, we were at the dinner and someone was like, Kev, you should really interview this guy, Epa Rixie, out in San Francisco. Epa already has a crazy weird name, and I'm like, okay. And Epa did a lot, I think what a lot of you might be doing is he went to Vanderbilt University uh, he was, I think, an engineer major with some business uh, classes on the side. But he went into his senior year, he actually had a job locked up with a top three consulting firm. I'll let you decide and guess which one it was. But he had a job locked up going into his last semester so he could basically kick it. He didn't have to worry and stress about it. Is he going to have a job? So he had a job and a salary lined up. So you would think everything was rainbow and butterflies for him. First year in, he goes onto the strategy consulting side. Second year in, he's still doing that, traveling. But Epp is the type of type A personality where when he gets involved with something, he goes really, really deep. And he really loves history. So on the nights and weekends, because he wasn't really feeling challenged, he spent every waking moment researching craft beer and every brewery in the country that has started a craft brewery. To the point where he actually got to connect with Jim, Koch, uh, or Jim Koch of Sam Adams Brewery. So at the time, it was I think three years into the consulting gig, they do a thing called an externship, where you can actually leave the consulting firm for three to six months, and they want you to get another perspective. You can go work somewhere else, uh, you might be able to go travel abroad, basically you have three to six months to take like a, a mini sabbatical in your 20s. And because he was doing all this stuff with craft, craft beer, and he felt not as challenged uh, there, he used his connection and audacity to wind up getting a connection at Lagunitas. But again, any of you that might know the craft beer industry, it's very, like, people don't dress like we're dressed. Like, it's very laid back, flannel shirts, warehouse. So when they heard consulting firm, externship, they were like, what the heck is an externship? We've never done this. I don't know if we can do this. So a phone call with, with uh, I think, their second in command, who was like, ah, we don't really know, but let, let us, let us uh, interview you. So the next day, he su submitted his resume, and the founder of Lagunitas sat down for 30 minutes. They called him back the day after and said, Epa, we love what you're doing. We clearly know you're into craft beer, know everything about it. 
But the really cool thing that we see is you have an understanding for strategy, growth, market share. Instead of doing a, an externship with us, how about we hire you full time to be our chief market strategist out in San Francisco? Him and his, I think they might have just got engaged, him and his girlfriend just moved to Dallas and he just kind of got promoted. This is like less than a month and he's like, I'm in. He goes out to San Francisco to the point now, I think he's been out there three years. I'll actually have a sh chance to actually meet him face to face this May. Uh, but he wound up taking, if you look at that Venn diagram, he's thriving, he's challenged, and he feels invincible. And he's loving everything he's doing while using his smarts that he learned in college and at the consulting firm. So that's story number two. What I want to share here, because I like to talk a little bit high level and, and give you context, but at the same time, I want to be super practical and give you some, something tactile to kind of take home and feel inspired by. So I want to leave you with three different uh, points and different tips that if I could go back and sit in a chair like this, uh, these are three things that I wish somebody told me. So the first one is, what are three things that you would do absolutely for free? So something you know, like Nikki. Nikki volunteered uh, and was a production assistant for a weekend, but what are three things you would do for free? And I've taught spoke and trained a lot of different people from college students like yourself to young professionals and, and every time this question comes up there's always someone in the room that like has three and there's always a couple people that are like I can't even come up with one and that's because they've gone through life and they've gone through the rat race so fast that they haven't even spent time to reflect and so I want to share with you how you can actually come up with an answer to that question first one is I would highly recommend that you guys journal it could be you journal once a year once a month it could be in your iPhone. It could be, uh, there's several apps out there that you could Google search and find out if there's an app that you want to journal. But I think especially as a college student, your, your, your four or five years here go by so fast that you don't realize what were those moments that I really felt like I was thriving and I was really excited and how can I put myself in that environment when I leave. The second thing is Google searching. That was one of Epa's pieces of advice on how he landed in the craft brewery industry. Someone told him, Epa, what do you Google search? And what do you think he was Google searching? Everything there is to know about craft beer in every brewery. The other one is your hobbies. So I love playing golf, but I also suck and I'm never gonna make a time off of it. But I've realized I have two or three other things that I love doing for free. So figure out what your hobbies are, but I also can guarantee you that if I want to start like a golf blog or Instagram account, I could probably do that and it would probably take a while to maybe generate some, some interest and some media to it, but I might be able to make some money off of it. So there might be a hobby that you have that you, believe it or not, could make, a, you know, make some side money or create a brand for yourself. There's a fourth one, uh, because I haven't updated this slide in a couple months. This past Tuesday night, we were up in New York City doing one of our fireside chats, and we interviewed this gentleman, Brian Campbell. He's the lead automotive writer for Gear Patrol. He literally has one of the coolest jobs. He gets to travel around the world and test drive Lamborghinis, Audis. He goes to Palm Beach he go, or Palm Springs. He goes to... Italy, he goes all over the place and he's 27 years old. And I was, the first question I asked him when we sat down that night, I was like, Brian, I'm like, what got you here? What was one moment or one person that got you here? And he said, he went to Rutgers University and went to design school and his professor that, you know, basically said, Brian, your designs suck. You're not, you're not real design cars. And he's like, well, what should I do? And his professor said, Brian, what do you like doing on the toilet? <laughs> And at the time, before we were so glued to our iPhones, he was looking at Motor Trend, Car and Driver magazine, and he was obsessed with all this. And that was when the moment clicked, I want to write, and I want to write for, about cars. And so he had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of adversities to get to where he is, but that was one of the other things. It was like, what do you do on the toilet? So just think about, what are you looking at in class on your iPhone? We'll keep it PG. Uh, the second thing that I want to leave you guys with is take risks and dive into discomfort. Show of hands, who is here sitting here that came this morning that feels like they pushed their comfort zone? They came with no friend maybe, or they didn't know what to expect, they're a little shy, right? Okay, it's okay, and some of you might not put your hands up. If it wasn't for somebody, you know, if it wasn't for me taking these, these, uh, these leaps of faith, both in college and being able to kind of start Habitat for Humanity Group, to the, taking that day off in July 20. Uh, 2006 and revamping my resume and doing something unconventional, I wouldn't be up here standing in front of you today. So I really want you to think of how are ways that you can take risks and dive into discomfort as, as much as it, it's going to pain you. One of the stories uh, of somebody that stood out, that, uh, this is the second, this is one of the last stories I want to leave you with, uh, going back to take risks and dive into discomfort, 
is Megan Genphardt was a senior at Michigan State University not, not too long ago, probably about uh, 2014. She was graduating and went into her fall semester and basically had the whole you know, real world epiphany of like, crap, I need to find a job. And she's whole, she, who's heard the word networking, right, and go to these events, but she didn't know how really how to network. And so what she wound up doing is her passion for coffee and people, she wound up starting 52 cups of coffee her senior year. She spent every week asking, can I take you out for coffee and can I just ha ask about your journey? How'd you get there? Uh, she interviewed people from her local town all the way to people uh, that were in their 80s that were uh, Vietnam and World War I and II vets, all the way to farmers, all the way to thought leaders like Seth Godin. Uh, and she basically spent that year building out her brand. Now you would think uh, that she might have went the entrepreneurship route, started a book, became a thought leader, right? It's actually not true. She harnessed her brand building and her connections and their love for coffee. And if you look her up on Twitter, she is right now, uh, I believe, like an HR recruiter for Airbnb out in San Francisco. So she, you know, a lot of companies that you might would, would die to work for, she was able to kind of have this resume and portfolio to display to them before she even uh, probably approached her resume. So she really found a unique way to, stay out, uh, to stand out, and I would really encourage you to consider something like Megan, because there's nothing stopping you from interviewing anybody here in DC, let alone anybody across the world. And the last one here is know yourself and embrace it. Often, uh, I, you know, even up until about three years ago, I heard the advice, and I'm sure you've heard it in high school and you're gonna hear it here, is you need to be well-rounded. You need to have A's in everything, and you need to be good in math and good in writing and good in this. What I have discovered, and this is especially true about anybody that has found their niche, is they have over-indexed on their strengths and realized how to put their weaknesses to the side. And again, if somebody didn't tell me I was a leader my junior year of high school, I wouldn't have gone on this crazy journey over the last 10 years. But sometimes you're like, well, how do I know myself, right? Because you may have not journaled, you may not have these, these moments in time. And the, the number one thing that I would challenge you to do is to go spend the next two months and find five people at minimum and say, hey, um, professor or former supervisor or your college roommate, what do you think I'm good at? What are my strengths? And they might joke around and say, well, you know, you're, you're, great at, uh, you know, you're great at Instagram or you're great at throwing a party or you're great at bringing people together. That might be an, a soft skill that you can utilize. But at the same time, you might be shocked at what they tell you. They might be like, wow, you are a really good writer or you're really analytical. And you may have never known that about yourself because you were going down one track. So finding a way to know yourself and embrace it is, is the last tip. So I wanna leave you with, because my whole message here is don't fit in, stand out. And what I wanna ask you and leave you with is how are you gonna do one thing this year to power your purpose and stand out? Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone um, wants to ask Kevin something, I'm sure he'd give you a lot of good info to go off. So anything's allowed. I'll answer any question. Personal, professional, how I got here, what's on your mind? Coach. Um, you said this, so we talk about the importance of social, social media. And sure. It is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, how do you stop it from like, just taking over your life? Like, there's a way that you can use it and be one of those people who use Google and yeah. make, you know, yeah. what happens if you have you like, separate it or should you not? Uh, my first response I want to say is look up and actually I can't stand when I have conversations with people that are just looking at their phone. Uh, I, as much as you can harness your digital brand and your social media connections like Nikki's story and then take that to a face-to-face -face interaction or vice versa, you meet somebody here at a conference, there's an enormous amount of ways that you can build a relationship online because you may not see them for another year or you might graduate and, and lose touch but there's so many ways that you can con continue to connect with them. And so. It's, it's obviously a balancing act, but it's figuring out how can you brand yourself online and get opportunities that you actually meet people face to face. And when you show up face to face, you better bring that too. So you could be great at Twitter or great a LinkedIn game, but if you can't smile, shake somebody's hand and hold a conversation, then any social media is not gonna help. So I think it's just a really just important just making eye contact, looking up, as well as just putting your phone down sometimes.
Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. My name is Tyler Luther. Um, my question for you is, uh, when building a personal website to kind of really create your brand, what information do you think is pivotal, especially for students who might not necessarily have a portfolio of that sure. their work? Sure, yeah. So I'm glad that you're even thinking about having a website. There's so many ways out there, and I'd be more than happy to talk about it um, during the book signing, as well as we have a lot of resources on our website. But I would say, uh, if I go to your website, I want to be able to, within about 10 seconds, be able to tell who you are. And, and, and I think the best way you can do that, and whether it's your website or LinkedIn portfolio, the number one thing that I, I recommend young professionals and college students to do is come up with three keywords, three keywords that describe you. And so for me, it's, it's digital storyteller, entrepreneur, and author slash speaker, right? But what are three words that would describe you? And so again, LinkedIn or, or website. And then I think underneath that, there needs to be a really fun, compelling, like three sentence bio. But if you're gonna put on a website, I would give me something creative. Don't give me what you would put on a resume. Um, and then under, you know, aside from having a placeholder, put out content. And that could be you, you filmed a video from your class, throw that there. You wrote a research paper, put it up there. Uh, you're writing a blog series uh, like Megan might have done, put it up there. Uh, so I think having who you are, what you're doing, uh, some content, and then don't forget to have a way that people can contact you. Easily have a contact page or your email or, or your resume downloadable. Uh, I think it depends obviously specifically how you want to use that website, uh, but those would be like three or four tangible things and I'd be more happy to give you some more resources later. Great question. Hi, there, everyone. Um, What's your name? My name is Danielle Sam. I'm a senior in the School of Business studying finance and marketing. Um, as a digital storyteller, I'm sure you are full of creativity, mm -hmm. um, as that's part of your job. But when you really just feel like you're running out of inspiration, um, where do you turn? Uh, my bed for sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a morning person, generally. So like, and even lately, I've been kicking myself when I get up at like five in the morning and I spend an hour on my iPad. I'm like, that could be an hour I could have, you know, wrote a blog post or done some work. Um, so I think one for me, it's energy and sleep. Um, but to give you a little bit more, uh, something a little bit more is I am very bad at when I get into routines. And that's one of the reasons I left higher ed. I worked at Rutgers, out of the eight years in student affairs, I worked at Rutgers for six years. Imagine going through the same thing every semester doing the same events, recruiting the same, like doing the same thing. So uh, anytime I, I have a routine, uh, I need to break that. And whether it's adjusting my work schedule, where I work, how I work, the clients I work with, or how I work with them. So for me, it's breaking a routine. One more? Hey, I'll give you a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess something that I experience a lot in college is I see a lot of these people who are so pressured going into it that they just want a major, they want the right internships, they want everything to be right so that their major goal is to like find a job right out of college. And you talked about a lot like breaking out of your comfort zone or doing stuff. But I feel like that could be really hard for some people and just like the part of challenging yourself can be harder than it seems. So, do you have any concrete tips to do that? Or like just like something to start it off like before you fall into that track of just doing, doing, doing? doing. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's a lot of pressure here. One, uh, being a GW, two, being in a major, the, you know, DC. Um, I think here, here's a tip, is I would say, uh, because we get, I also adjunct here, so I know like we're preaching like go to these events, go to these networking things, right? Um, if you were somebody that might be shy like me, I would say like drag your roommate and just be like, you are not a business major or whatever, but like I need you to come with me. Like I just need you to be my like wing person. Um, so I think finding somebody that could be an advocate and like maybe help push you. Uh, same thing, find somebody uh, or a buddy system that will hold you accountable. So maybe you guys are doing two different things, but uh, going back to Tyler's question, be like, hey, I'm gonna start a website. Maybe he finds his roommate and be like, hey, by April 15th, if I don't have a website up, like we're not going out this weekend. Or, so have some type of accountability system. Um, and, and I think the third thing is your career and your life is supposed to be a little bit messy. You're supposed to procrastinate. You're supposed to say yes to things you should have said no to. And you say things no, you know, things, uh, you say no to things that you should have said yes to. And what uh, my wife preaches a lot from Sheryl Sandberg's book is your career is a jungle gym, not a ladder. 
Uh, so if you think you're going to go to GW, get great grades, get an internship, get a degree, and then go get that job, and then skyrocket, like, that might be great for a few of you, but from what I see is I think you need to take a lot of zigzag moments. Um, that would be my... my